This is Risk and Rewards on this rainy Friday. John Authors, Lisa Abramowitz, where we talk about basically everything and figure out how to make it all about inflation. This time we don't have to do that. We have to take inflation and make everything else relate to that because that is the main story of the week other than John Authors falling off a cliff, evidently. I hope that everything is okay over there yes. in this rainy Friday. But yes. the inflation read, the CPI print yes. coming out, hottest yes. uh, in 30 years, a game changer. Yes. Yes, very much so. Very, very, very much so. Uh, I, I am on a phone for a change, everyone. So this is why uh, this is why the world is in less of a balance than uh, less of a balance than usual. The key thing I think about what we saw with uh, inflation this week is simply that the notion of transitory, in a sense that meant anything meaningful at all, is now over. People are complaining to me when I say this shows that this isn't transitory. That I'm somehow saying if it's not transitory, then it must be permanent that it's never going to end. I'm certainly not saying anything like that, but that um, uh, the levels of which we've reached are now plainly at the level where they, they won't go away without some kind of response. Uh, and it now be behooves us all to try to work out how long this goes on and what to do about it, which are actually far harder questions, I think, than uh, whether it was something that would go away quickly. And there was another data point that came out uh, about uh, less than two hours ago that really highlighted the difficulty that you're talking about. Inflation could be good. It could be bad when it comes to the global economy. But right now what we're seeing in the U.S. economy is that consumer sentiment fell to the lowest in a decade yes. as a result of some of the inflationary pressures. Sounds really dire problematic. However, yes. on the flip side, you saw job openings uh, continue to come down just a touch, but you saw a record number of Americans quit their jobs for better paying yes. jobs elsewhere. This is not a weak labor market. No, it isn't. Uh, I guess that's one of the two key questions for the for the uh, for what happens to inflation next year is how strong that labor market is and whether it has an inflationary effect. Uh, we don't have the, the Atlanta Fed wage tracker data yet for last month, but the you know the most recent that we do have showed the biggest increases for people who switched job in I think it was three decades. Um, so you know, plainly those who are switching are finding a big advantage to doing so. Um, if you look at the Michigan data, the other thing that's quite interesting um, is that it's one of those rare things where consumers, normal people, actually seem to think roughly the same way as the bond market. So um, so the one-year inflation prediction is, uh, I, from memory, 4. I don't have my experience. Yes, 4. high. 9%. And the recommendation for five years ahead didn't move and is still basically to suggest that the Fed gets things back under control, right. which is exactly also what you get from the five year break even compared to the five year, five year break even in the in the tips market. So that the, there is still a sense um, and having been somewhat alarmist about inflation or negative about inflation for a long time. I think it's important to point that out, that there, there is still quite a broad sense that this isn't going to run unchecked, that it does come under control within a matter of years. Okay, I'm going to channel Debbie Downer because I do that every day. I, the one concern that I have, and this is a significant concern, there is a difference between a slowdown and a recession. Parsing yes. the hairs between the two can be difficult. And I'm yes. not saying that we're yes. heading toward recession by any means, shape, or form. Yes. Yeah. We have a very hot labor market by many gauges. Yes. But the fact that people don't want to buy items as much because they do not view the buying environment as favorable to them because of the inflationary outlook, because mm. they expect it to be such a robust uh, pace of inflation over the next year, yes. raises questions about how much momentum we can have heading into a year that may be rocky. I mean, how much yes. have we brought forward some of the expectations, certainly in the asset pricing uh, of, of growth and how quickly could we slow? This is a question that I think is is hard mm. to answer and is one of the conundrums for the Federal Reserve yes. where markets are expecting them to, to tighten pretty yes. directly. And yet they're saying, just wait, you know, the fiscal uh, cliff is coming. We have the runoff of stimulus. We have all of these things coming. We want to yes. wait. People saying, uh, you really? Well, it, exactly. It's, it's uh, uh, I, I'm quite it's amazing. That there are two people who seem to actually want to be uh, the next chair of the, the Federal Reserve because it's not a job. <laughs> it's not a job I would like. Um, and uh, uh, the, the chances of being getting it wrong are elevated because there are these different 
cross currents that you've just beautifully expressed. Plainly, there are reasons to think this is a genuinely hot economy, but there are also reasons to think that, you know, that, that we've still got that many people who aren't in a job, uh, and you have low consumer sentiments, and so on. There, there are plenty of good reasons to be very nervous about um, doing anything too aggressive. There's also China, uh, where again, there's, nobody is suggesting there's a recession coming in China, and if there is, all bets are off. But if you're talking slowdown, deceleration from the growth we've become accustomed to, that looks overwhelmingly likely at this point. Uh, depending on how bad that is, that also affects how strong we can affect, expect the uh, American and European economies to be. So I'm going to ask you what you think. Yeah. What's the bigger risk right now for the Federal Reserve? Hiking too soon and curtailing growth at a time when it is slowing down naturally uh, for a whole host of reasons uh, versus hiking too late and allowing things to get a little carried away and either uh, being forced to raise rates very quickly and uh, torpedoing the economy or allowing inflation to curtail demand enough that it also torpedoes the economy. My best guess, that both of those are very real risks. Um, and it requires immense amounts of you know, serious econometric. There is actually a real role for an, eco an economic economist, a mathematical economist here, that, that you know, their, their roles can be denigrated. But this is a tricky stuff where those, those models, those tools help. I still think the greater risk is leaving it too late um, because once uh, a genie is out of a bottle, and again, I'm not, talking 70s, but I am talking, you know, early 90s is perfectly possible. It's very much harder and requires that much more aggressive work to put back in the bottle. And given where assets prices are, given how much is constructed on the foundations of stunningly low interest rates, which can be justified by, you know, the stunningly low inflationary environment, I would not want to see what happened in that, that, that situation. Uh, so I would be, I would be myself more likely to make a hawkish error, because I think a dovish error would ultimately, if that could ultimately be worse. There's a greater downside to a dovish error. And I know that Mohammed Alarian would very much agree with you on yes, a whole multitude true. of levels. Mm. What do you think that the Fed's bond buying has actually done when it comes to the inflationary outlook? Very little. I mean, it, it might it might have distorted um, break evens, um, and obviously the yield curve is another which we haven't. Not often the two of us talk for eight minutes and don't mention the yield curve once. But yeah, the, the yield curve at it's this point is flattening, which again tends to suggest we're not talking runaway inflation here. We're talking about uh, the Fed having to do something sooner rather than later and choking things off, which isn't good, but it's not runaway inflation. So Sorry, the, other question, yeah. the other yes. question that I would say, mm -hmm. if the bond buying program has not had a material effect on inflation, mm -hmm. what about low rates? How much <laughs> has low rates exacerbated some of the inflationary impulse that we're seeing right now? That's a very good question. Uh, I think there you can certainly argue that even low rates, this, this, this I suppose is, does get to the heart of why a hawkish why I might be wrong and a hawkish error might be worse because so much of the aspects of inflation that we have at this point is driven by supply. Uh, and there's a, a, you know, a cliche that is being used much more at the moment that, that, uh, that you shouldn't tighten into a supply crisis. Um, that said, once you see the sort of general pickup in expectations in inflationary psychology that we've seen, uh, and that was what I thought was most alarming about the uh, report of earlier this week. It wasn't so much that the headline number went up. It was that uh, the components were just so much broader that, that, that most components are now above 2%, that, 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 that sticky prices went up the fastest in some decades that, that, that are measured separately by the Atlanta Fed. That, you know, that those are all signs that... Uh, uh, that uh, that some kind of an inflationary psychology is taking hold, and that that needs to be uh, that needs to be counteracted. I would argue the yeah. one aspect of the uh, of the inflation read 
that really caught my attention yeah. was the rent increase. The fact that rent prices are going up seems directly correlated. Some people would disagree with this. Some people would say it's just a supply demand uh, issue as well, because uh, there were fewer houses built in the period from 2007 onward after the crisis. And so it was a supply issue and then sudden demand to move out of the cities. Other people would say it was fueled by the idea that mortgage rates were incredibly low and that people were buying yes. a lot of homes as an investment thesis. The broader issue to me is how much does this exacerbate some of the wealth inequalities, the longer it goes on, that the lower tier of income earners are going to struggle more with the inflation. Yes. They have fewer assets in the market getting propped up by some of these programs. And on the flip side, wealthy individuals will probably get paid more and are seeing some of the bigger increases in their wages at a time when they also have their money in the stock market. Exactly. Uh, I wonder how much that changes the conversation in the upcoming months as the Federal Reserve tries to target equality issues and, yes. and how do they parse this out? Because it's a very tricky thing to do while also not torpedoing the markets and the economy. It, yes, again, again, it, you know, Lael and Jerome, thank you very much for being prepared to even think of doing this. The, the, I, I think... Um, that, you know, I mean, this is a very profound issue. One other point I'd make on that, that the New York Fed does its own survey of inflation expectations, which they break down a number of ways. Uh, and what fascinated me was inflation expectations are two percentage points higher among those without, uh, with high school diploma or less than they are among those with college degrees, um, which I suspect is because the basket of goods they're buying is indeed already inflating higher, faster than the basket of goods that um, uh, you know, you know, educated upper middle class and rich people are, are buying, and that's very, very concerning. Um, it's it's been a, it's, it's it's not surprising, but it's uh, it's very concerning. I think there are legitimate reasons though here that you know the Fed's mandate, as it should be, is about inflation. And unemployment. They are given the central bank has to be given a lot of freedom of movement because it needs to move quickly in moments like March of last year. Um, I'm not sure it has the legitimacy to try to take on equality as an issue. There are obviously very you know, beyond our pay grade as well. There are huge political principle reasons about whether one should try to. Uh, correct inequality or not? Um, I think it does make the it does make the job for the for the Federal Reserve very very much harder. I I I, I, I don't have a good answer for you there. Well, no, but it's well said laying out some of the issues. Before we go, uh, and we always end up running out of time, I do yeah. want to get your take on the big breakups, the idea that General yeah. Electric uh, ended its reign as its behemoth, breaking up into oh. three separate companies. And then this morning, Johnson & Johnson saying it was going to separate into two. I'm wondering if there is a connector at all with these two very different companies mm. that they are trying to deconglomeratize at the same time. Yeah, there probably is. Uh, it, You're like, I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, well, well, I know. There's, the other one that fascinates me is um, uh, part of this is generational and part of this is that the, the man on top is over 90. But um, uh, Warren Buffett, who I think is actually about the same age as Jack Welsh, is also out of favour. NVIDIA is now a bigger stock by market cap than Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, and Berkshire Hathaway ultimately is a conglomerate that happens to be run by the greatest stock picker ever to have lived, but it's a conglomerate. Uh, and that's obviously also getting out of uh, out of favor. Um, the, the notion now is the platform, Google, Facebook, the founding stocks, rather than the conglomerates, it's not clear that the financing within a conglomerate is any better than just getting your financing from the market. I would also argue mm. that perhaps in an era of indexing, where there's slicing yes. and dicing of the market yes. according to categorization, there's a lot more money if you specify your business, because people can then target you uh, by funneling money through ETFs or other types of factor-based funds into uh, your, your assets. I do wonder how much that's, albeit yes. a much smaller factor, but something that's at play as well. We are out of time. I hope that you have a wonderful weekend, that you stay dry as it pours here in New York City and across uh, the north.